Today we're in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we're sitting with a pitcher that spent a lot of time in the big leagues. And it was the golden age of baseball, it was the 1950s. And even though he wasn't chubby, and even though he wasn't skinny, his nickname was Skinny. And he was one of the best pitchers that the Orioles ever had before their pitching staff started, started taking them to the World Series in the mid and late 1960s. So today, in Greensboro, North Carolina, we get to speak to Major League veteran pitcher, Hal Brown. Now, my first question is, uh, being born down here, what town were you born in? Well, I was born in, in what was called Pomona at the time I was born, which was almost part of Greensboro, but it was outside of the city limits. It was a cotton mill village, and so it became Pomona, which was a town in itself. I gotcha. And you were one of how many kids? I was, I was one, of, one of eight children. Really? And I was, and where did you fall in from youngest to oldest? Well, I was almost in, in the middle. Uh, I, had, uh, I had two brothers and, and five sisters. And uh, I was, uh, had two sisters and a brother younger than I was. So I was about as close to the middle as you could get. When we, when we did an interview on the West Coast with Bobby Doerr, he, Bobby Doerr said he grew up in Los Angeles. So I said to him, why did you play second base? And he said, because she was sitting right next to him, he goes, my sister had a better arm and she was at shortstop. <laughs> Did you um, play ball with your brothers? Was it the, the Browns playing together? Nothing uh, as the, the, just in the yard playing the sandlot ball. But uh, my older brother was not interested in, in baseball, but my younger brother, which was the baby of the family, did take an interest in baseball because he was quite a few years younger and did play one year in the minor league. He really? But uh, was not, uh, just was not interested in uh, determined enough. He had too many other things, women for one thing, that he was after more than he was the baseball. <laughs> These things happen. That yeah, gets right. in the way. Um, the good story is about your sister. When you played baseball, nobody called you how. They called you skinny. Um, you were given uh, a little bit to me before the camera started rolling. How did you get your nickname Skinny? Well, I was uh, because I was real fat when I was a baby, and everybody had to have a, a, a nickname growing up, and it just stuck with me. In baseball, it was a nickname was great. It had some significant that it was different than others, you know, like Dizzy Trout and all, oh, sure. all kinds of. Fire trucks. Yeah, nicknames was uh, uh, was something that they took. Didn't take long when you, if you you became a professional baseball player and got in the news. It didn't take long till your nickname got out, and that was it. It stuck. Right. Now you, um, when you graduated from high school, you, the Red Sox baseball team was looking at you. Uh, yes, uh, they was. Uh, in fact, at that time, there was not scholarships in colleges or anything. And so the Red Sox were sending me to, to college. And I agreed if they would send me to college, I would sign with them when I finished college. Uh -huh. But as things happened, the war came along and I got almost one full year of college. and. Uh, went in the service. My brother was drafted. And at that time, the war was pretty strong. And we were losing a lot of people that was out trying to protect, I felt, like this country. And so instead of uh, waiting to be drafted, I volunteered at, eight, did? at 18. And uh, I was 18 in December and went in the service in March. And uh, and by September, I was overseas. Where did they send you to? Uh, well, I was, went went to Europe. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, I was across the channel to France, on across the, to Germany. During the, the three years, I was overseas. Twenty, uh, I believe it was twenty six months all told. What did you see? What did you? What sticks with you? Because you know, kids will be looking at it, um, and they only read about that war in the history books. You're walking, talking. Well, I'm not walking, talking, it, uh, because I tell you, uh, 
it's almost like I don't believe it happened. Really? It's the same way just like my baseball career. I watch baseball uh, on TV now, and I said, I didn't really play there. I, I wasn't in the major. That well, it wasn't me. It must have been someone else. Uh, I, you know, I, I just don't believe. Uh, I know they did happen, but they're things that I don't really talk about unless sure. they're brought up for some reason. Today it's so much different. There's no such thing as the draft. If you're a teenager or if you're a young man in your 20s, if you're associated with the military, that's because they did what you did. They enlisted. Well, that is true, and that's why I feel like the way I do this now about these people. These are people that's doing this on their own, not because they're drafted and in going into to the military, but because they want to defend this country. They are, they are soldiers. They are professional soldiers. And it's, it's sad to see some of these uh, young men lose their lives. It's got, it has such a young family. I agree. But uh, uh, it's because of them this country is what it is. And I'm afraid a lot of times we're not keeping this country the way it should be. It's, um, it's built on a strong base from previous wars. And um, with terrorism, I, uh, I was a school teacher in the classroom and watched uh, that second plane go right into the World Trade Center. And it's amazing the power of hatred. You know, to attack uh, us or for anyone to attack anyone without uh, initiating anything. Well, I, it's hard for me to believe that people, all of these uh, bombs, how somebody sacrificed, uh, can get in a car loaded with bombs and just bunch of people they don't know, have no reason to, to, to kill people. Uh -huh. it's, uh, they're, they're not human beings to me, they're, they're something else. They, they're, they're, they're nothing that the good Lord expected us to be. You know, I understand. Society. With baseball, a lot of times they have um, different people throughout the first pitch. And you were in Baltimore, uh, the Washington Senators and Mickey Vernon weren't far away. Were you ever in the company or the area of one of the presidents because of being in baseball for so long? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I uh, one year I was a starting pitcher for Baltimore against the Washington Senators back then. Right. And uh, uh, Truman was there, and I've got some pictures of my dad was there, and Truman throwing out the first ball. Really? And so... Uh, Yes, I, I one year I, with with Washington, uh, the opening of the season. Used to the president was always there with somebody throwing out out the ball to start the season. Was well, that a big thrill for you? Well, yes, but the big, big thrill really to me was the getting ready for this game to win this game. Right. That that was the most important because the president came in just for a short time. Sure. Uh, but it, it was uh, it's something uh, it, it, it's something that a lot of people never have the privilege to, to know what it feels like or to do. Do you remember the game? Did you do okay? Uh, I don't remember the game. It's okay. <laughs> I figured I'd ask. But with, um, with coming up with Boston as a pitcher, um, you were able to you had this really good season with the Red Sox before you went over with Baltimore. Did something click? You know, because it was your first really good season after breaking into baseball. Well, the only thing that clicked was I got a chance to pitch regular and uh, yeah. uh, got a few runs. And uh, so uh, that was a, a great, I think that was the beginning of my best where people realized that I was a, a, a ball player. You were holding your own. I think, w was another guy on the staff, was it Mel Parnell? Mm-hmm, yeah. He wasn't doing too bad either. No, Mel, Mel was a great left-hand pitcher. In fact, uh, Mel, I, I think, uh, I think he's in the Hall of Fame. He He's in the Red Sox Hall of Fame, I, I believe. Yeah, well, I know he's in the Red Sox Hall of Fame. Now, this guy that was hitting in your lineup, uh, the Splendid Splinter, you got you got a great season under your belt before you left for Baltimore, but you got to watch one of the greatest hitters who ever lived. 
memories? Because he had his own unique style, and he definitely had a unique personality. Well, he he was a unique person and probably the greatest hitter that ever was. But it's like I heard the a doctor who uh, helped look after him in spring training say that if he had taken up professional boxing, he'd probably been the heavyweight boxing really? of the world. That his coordination was the great. His uh, hand to eye uh, the coordination was so great. So, uh, and he was a, a, an individual. Uh, I, uh, one year uh, in spring training, we both was, lived in the same hotel, and he was cornered and bothered by a sports writer so much that uh, he eat in his room a lot of time. Sure. And so he had, uh, had a lot of times he'd call me and ask me to come eat with him. Really? Right. I've got, uh, in fact, my, my son-in-law has it now, but I have a, a rod and reel that he gave me. He, he made, uh, got in that business a long time ago. Sure. And uh, so I still got that. Which he, he loved he fishing. Yes, he, he did. Bobby Doerr, once again, when we did an interview with him, he said, Billy, I went out there on the boat with him and fishing, and I got lucky and caught a really good fish. I was happy. Ted was so angry, he told me he never wanted to go fishing with me again. <laughs> cussing left, cussing right, I thought I did okay. <laughs> he goes, he was even competitive when it was fishing. Well, he was, uh, uh, I never met a person just like him. Yeah. Uh, he. Uh, I remember I was there when he came back from, uh, after he'd, he'd been in the uh, Korean War, I guess it was. Sure. And uh, uh, I remember the first time he went to bat, he pinched hit. And uh, the guy threw what we call at that time was a screwball, which was went away from left hand hitter, the way and down. And the first time he pitched hit, pinched hit, and uh, Lou Boudreau was the manager, okay. and uh, had a man on third third base, and this was in the seventh inning, and so we figured at least we'd get a fly ball, uh, hoping for a home run, but anyway, he hit the highest fly you ever saw, an infield fly, right? and come back cussing like hell, as you say it, yep. and said that ball broke, didn't break as much as I thought it was going to break, a half inch more. Instead of a fly ball it, uh, that he hit, would have been a, would, would have been a, a line drive somewhere. He was angry. Uh, yeah, but uh, talking about the ball did not break as much as right as much as you know. so. But uh, he was a unique person, and as I said, the sports writers followed him around everything he did. They was in the hotel looking over his, over the door trying to find out what he was doing all the time. When you, uh, before you went to the Orioles, since you came up with the Red Sox, did you have your closest friend on the team and that you spent the most time with, or a roommate? Well, not at, not at that time. Uh, I, uh, of course, that, that I was with the White Sox to start with, and I guess Nellie Fox and I, our family got yeah. as close as anybody. And, uh, Actually, we saw them some after the season and after the was through playing ball. Um, and of course, he died early from cancer. But uh, his, his wife, she remarried, and and we saw her. She was through Greensboro uh, too many years ago and came out for a visit. And came right. Well, that teammate of yours is in the Hall of Fame, Nellie Fox. No, yes. He made it to the Hall of Fame. Right. And, uh, of course, I have a lot of a lot of teammates and great memories. And, you know, at my age, and a lot of had, was the, some, of, some of them are not around. It's, yeah. They haven't been as fortunate as I have. I didn't ask you. How, how old are you? Well, I'm 87. Now you don't look it and I'm you don't not, act it. I'll be 80, 88 come December. So, uh, 
Shake your head and can't believe that either? No, I can't. <laughs> but the only thing I have, hope I have my mother's genes. She lived to 94. My daddy dropped dead at 70. 